Hope everybody's doing well this morning. My name's Kyle Johnson. For those of you that are first timers or new with us this morning, I'm one of the elders here at Capital City Church. I wanna welcome you. Uh, one of the things we'll do to begin this morning, I'll just lay out the first few things we'll do. One of the most regular we do is confession. Every Sunday morning, we begin with confession together corporately. I was thinking a little bit this morning on sin. I know that's not the most exciting thing to start thinking about first thing in the morning, but I actually made some mistakes yesterday at the K-State football game, and so uh, <laughs> I did. Don't ask my wife about it. But, you know, sin, <laughs> sin, I was just thinking about the temporal nature, but the permanent nature as well. You know, when man fell, there was this plague that came over us of sin. And that's been cured by Jesus Christ. But there's this temporal thing about sin and the embarrassment and shame that can sometimes go with it. And I think I might be speaking to a few people in here. Uh, I believe that the evil one uses the embarrassment and shame that you feel after you make a mistake to keep you from the love and peace that God wants to provide to you. Just like Adam and Eve when they hid behind the tree so it is our nature after we've made a mistake just to feel so uncomfortable about coming before the Lord and you carry this baggage with you but that's not the way it's supposed to be as you recall the father called them out from behind the tree and then he sacrificed an innocent animal to cover their shame and so it is your permanent sin has built, been dealt with as you confess and give your life to Jesus Christ but the temporal nature of sin, the symptoms, so to speak, of the plague of sin still persist. And it's the anxiety, the insecurity, the embarrassment of that, that the evil one just will drive as far as you'll let him. And I want to encourage you that that's not what God has for you. A loving father wants you to turn to him no matter how you feel and enjoy the blessing of peace and forgiveness from a loving father. See, I told you I was thinking about sin this morning. <laughs> Good night. So what we're going to do, we're going to pray. I'm going to give you a little bit of time just to center yourself, just to kind of put aside the things of what's going on this week, good, bad, and everything in between, and set aside this hour to be with the father. Let him minister to your heart. Let him bless you. I'm going to do that. Then we're going to stand and read confession together. Uh, we'll have one song from Kevin. I'm sorry, Kevin, I didn't introduce you like I said I would. Kevin's from the Southern Baptist Convention, Director of Communication and Worship for the Kansas and Nebraska Convention, and he's here serving us this morning. So thank you for being here. But after that first song, we're going to move into a time of communion. So if you do not have one of the cups with the drink and the bread, I might encourage you to raise your hand. We'll have some folks coming around that can give you one here during this first song, okay? So if you'll bow your heads with me, we'll take a moment in silence. Father in heaven, you created us free men and women, children of yours. And yet, by the fall of man, we have been plagued with sin. An incurable disease save for the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And yet, for some of us who have given our lives to you, there are still symptoms that persist. Insecurity, anxiety, embarrassment that comes from those symptoms and yet you hold your hands out openly as a loving father I pray this morning for your blessing on this service father in heaven see this family uh, gather together continue to weave us together and I pray that you would be blessed 
Holy Spirit, I pray that you would attend to us, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive the truth, that it would compel us to loving you more, to being more kind, to being more patient, to being more loving. Father, that our hearts would be lifted in worship this morning as Kevin leads us, that you would bless him and this team, that they would bless our hearts in song. So we give you this hour. We pray your will on it. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you'll stand with me. Let's read together. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we as poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace that you have given and help us to walk to newness of life that you have given in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
out of Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating together, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take this and eat it. This is my body. I'd like you to take your bread and eat it. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink it again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Drink. And Jesus, we do thank you this morning. We thank you for the blessing of your sacrifice for our sin. Thank you this morning that we can bow our heads in memory of you and what you've done on the cross for us and how it applies to us today, 2,000 years later. We love you for it. And we'll sing to you for that purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. You give up, you are. 
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Love deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child. This morning, the scripture is from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 5, and then 17 through 21. <clears throat> and these are so good. I got to see the set list prior, and we're going to sing at the end here. I will sing of the goodness of God, right? And I think when I read this, I think of that song. It's my favorite song of all. <sighs> anyway, I will extol you, my God and King. And bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. 
On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever.
Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what's even funnier about that is that um, as Kevin and I were talking, and, and we, we've known each other for a little while now, um, great guy, by the way, phenomenal, phenomenal work helping us out this morning. Yeah, absolutely. And what's really cool about it is Kevin's been a real encouragement to Eric as well. They've connected and, you know, building a friendship. And so I was talking to him before church and I said, you know, like if things don't go perfect, we're, it's fine, right? And so there you go. Thanks for, we're on brand. This is, this is what we do. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to read uh, just a couple of verses um, five verses to be specific, and then we're going to dive into a little bit different type of sermon this morning, uh, beginning in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 8. Now you're going to understand very quickly that there's a context here, and you may not understand the context. We'll explain it more in just a second. But for the sake of these verses, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, we, one of the things we do around here is stand as we're reading Scripture. It's just a way for us to, we believe, uh, show a little bit of respect, even if it's just kind of on the outside, right? Hopefully that translates to our hearts. Uh, so, again, I know there are a couple of you that are visiting with us for the first time. Some of you, it's been a while. Um, just going to give you a warning. This is a very different type of sermon that you've walked into. Uh, we do this from time to time, but we don't do it regularly. We just finished up a 13-part series preaching through the book of Colossians. And so we're going to today kick off kind of a little two-part mini-series. And next week, I'll just go ahead and give you a heads up. Next week, we're going to make a big announcement. And I am really excited. In fact, um, I may be as excited about this announcement as I have been of anything that we've done since we've started as a church. It's really, really fun. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that next week. But I, I was trying to figure out as I was thinking through next week and what that's going to look like, I was trying to figure out how do we unpack this announcement in light of who we are as a church. And it quickly turned into either next week we were going to have a four hour long church service which nobody except me is okay with, because uh, three and a half hours of it would have been sermon. I'm just being honest with you. Or we got to back up and, and kind of revisit a big idea for us as a church. And so as you walk through the foyer here, um, you may have seen there's a big banner when you walk in. It's the first thing that you see. And it actually lists four core values. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is one of our core values. We call it radical generosity. And we're going to unpack that in light of unpacking this passage. Uh, and so for me, this is the way I think about this. And, and for, for some of you, you've heard me say this before. I'm a car guy, right? So, and I, I have been my whole life, even when I was a kid, I could tell you what the different models were. And I didn't know how I knew, I just knew, mainly because I was interested in it. I was paying attention to it. And so even now, when I go to look at a vehicle to purchase, or I actually go and help other people purchase vehicles, as crazy as that sounds, it's just, there's, there's a fun part of it to me. I just love cars. But always, ultimately, I want to ask a question. We don't ask this question as much anymore with vehicles, but I think we should. What's under the hood? Like, what's going on under the hood? I need to know because of all the other features that you can give us, what's under the hood is going to drive us toward where we want to go. It doesn't matter how comfortable the seats are if the engine doesn't run. Are you following what I'm saying? What is it that powers, is going to power us as the three of us get in this car, the four of us get in this car, or some of you who are maybe younger or older, maybe you've got a car that only seats two people. Uh, God's blessing on you. How fun is that, right? 
uh, what does it look like for us when we're together? What is it that drives us and moves us toward whatever our destination is? So for us as a church, one of those things is the idea of radical generosity. Now everybody look at me, take a deep breath, and exhale. We're not talking about you being generous to the church. So everybody, this is not about you should give more. There's not a snag at the end where we try to get you to give. We're not, this is not about that at all. We're unpacking an idea of what it means for us to be generous as things leave the church. Generosity, as a biblical, as a New Testament idea, means much more than money, okay? And yet, and, and, and I think this is one of the, the blessings and the curses of the way that we talk about money in, in the church, right? When you hear the term generosity in church, what do you think of? Money, right? When you hear the term stewardship in church, what do you think of? Part of the reason for that is that generosity means much more than money, but it does primarily often mean money, and so radical generosity for, for us, and, and if for those of you who are filling out and taking notes, you're gonna, we're going to have some fill in the blanks. Radical generosity is this idea that generosity without benefit is a radical idea. Generosity without benefit. In other words, this is what that means. We want to, as a church, be generous in ways that will never benefit us. We want to bless people in ways that will never benefit us directly, maybe not even indirectly. We want to be generous without benefit to ourselves because the truth is, I, like I said, I'm a car guy. I love to buy my wife a new car, right? But what's the benefit? I also get to drive the new car. What does it look like for us to be generous in ways that don't benefit ourselves at all we want to be most generous with things that do not benefit us in any way, whether that's in our community, whether it's around our state, whether it's around our nation, or whether it's even around the world. In 2 Corinthians 9, not long after, if you look at 2 Corinthians, not long after the verses that we read today, Paul unpacks this idea. Here you go. Each one must give uh, as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion for, what does it say? God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that doesn't mean that God hates a reluctant giver. God wants us to give. He wants us to be givers. But here it goes. This is in your notes. God is most pleased with people who are most generous. God wants us to be givers. I'll let you finish writing so that you can look back up here because this is a really important thing. I love it that you're taking notes, by the way. You're going to hear us talk about this a lot. You'll hear me say this sentence often. God wants us to be givers, but God wants us to want to be givers. God doesn't want us to do it reluctantly. God doesn't want us to do it under compulsion. And by the way, this doesn't just describe you and me and that guy over there. This can describe us corporately, as a body, as a church, because who are we as a church if it's not just made up of you and me and that guy over there, right? This is, I, and I tell people this all the time. They'll, they'll ask me questions about Cap City Church, or they'll ask me a question and say, well, I don't know if you can tell me that. I don't know if you're allowed to tell me that. And I'll tell you just about anything I can tell you because here's the thing, and I say this often. It's not my church. It's your church. I mean, it's God's church. But it's your church. There's no secrets here. This is your church because it's made up of all of us together. And if God can convince us in our hearts to be cheerful givers, then guess what kind of church we're going to be? We're going to be a church that loves to give and bless others. So the context for this passage, we're going to work through it, and then I'm going to make a couple of observations at the very end here. The context for this passage was that these believers who were in the city of Corinth, this is a book called 2 Corinthians. Everybody listen. Here's your Bible scholar lesson, right? The book's called 2 Corinthians because there was also a book called, check that out, right? 
So this is 2 Corinthians. It was a letter written to a church in a city called Corinth, and they were called Corinthians, right? And so actually Paul wrote that we know of, he wrote three letters. He wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. He wrote another letter, which has come to be called the lost letter. And I don't, I'm not, it's not lost like I'm looking for my keys. It's lost like we don't have it anymore. God didn't want us to have that one. That wasn't an inspired letter. Then we got 2 Corinthians. This is kind of how we got here. These believers in Corinth, see if you can identify with this. I love how practical the Bible is. I love how current the Bible is. These believers had heard about a lot of poor Christian believers in the city of Jerusalem, which for them was far away. But they had heard that there were people who were going to Jerusalem, maybe for other reasons, and were committing their lives to follow Christ. And this is the part that may not sound right to you, but it would have made sense to them. People who were committing to follow Christ and joining the local church, and then they were experiencing financial and even vocational fallout. We talk about suffering for your faith. These people were actually suffering for their faith. And there were many poor believers in the city of Jerusalem who had chosen this new faith. And in some ways they had lost everything. And so see if this doesn't sound familiar. See if you can identify with this, even if you've never actually done it. We can imagine this. The believers in Corinth said, oh, you're taking up an offering to help them? We want to be a part of that. How many of you have made a verbal commitment to do something that maybe you didn't follow through on? Okay, yeah. Thank you for those of you who are honest in church. Don't we all do this? That sounds like a great idea. We should do it. And it is a great idea, but maybe not so much with the follow through, right? Maybe we didn't do so well with the follow through. Well, that's where they were. They had committed to join these churches in what Paul's calling the Macedonian churches, which would have been Philippi. We have another book in our New Testament called what? Philippians, right? The, the church in Thessalonica. We have a couple of those, don't we? A First Thessalonians, a Second Thessalonians, and the church in Berea, which is kind of this famous church in Acts, right? Because they were such a great church. These, church. these were the churches that made up the churches in Macedonia that Paul's talking about. And so Corinth says, hey, we want in on that. You're going to take up an offering to help people who are in need? We want in on that. But then they got distracted. Come on, y'all. Tell me scripture's not practical. They got distracted by internal strife. They got distracted by internal dissension and some arguments. In fact, if you go back and read 1 Corinthians, you can read what some of that strife was, can't you? Some of you who are familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, they were a hot mess. Is it possible to be a hot mess and still want to bless other people? Look me right in the eye. It's absolutely possible, despite what social media will tell you. Because life is full of nuance. And we think everybody's either wearing a black hat or a white hat. And that's not how life works. These were well-meaning people who were also a mess. You know who else I know who are well-meaning people, but they're kind of a mess? I love you. It's all of us including me. This is what it means to be believers. This is us. We're trying well. So Paul's goal, by the way, and then we're going to step through these verses. Paul's goal is to motivate these people through the story. In other words, he's saying, look, you guys agreed to join these churches in Macedonia and giving this money. Let me tell you about what they're doing. And my goal is to motivate you to fulfill the commitment that you made because... Your internal strife and your dissension will actually be helped if you kind of get over yourselves and bless somebody who can't do anything for you. Take that home with you. Maybe it's not just about me and you staring in the mirror at how beautiful we are, right? Maybe it's about helping other people. Let me tell you about the story of God's work in Macedonia and they're completing their own collection for these saints in Jerusalem. And let me tell you about it because you should do the same thing. So we say, here we go, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. He's going to tell us how generous they are. But it's almost like he says, before I tell you how generous they are, I want you to know about, listen, this is so big. 
I want you to know about how much God's grace has impacted them. Listen, because the two things are connected. They're not generous because there's these natural, angelic, holy people who don't, their feet don't even touch the ground. They just float around and they get, no, it's people like you and I who are kind of hot messes, but God's grace came in like a huge asteroid and it cratered their soul. It hit them in such a jarring way that they can't help but be generous. These two things are connected. I want you to understand how God's grace impacted them before you understand how generous they are. Why? Because radical generosity is fueled by grace. Radical generosity is always primarily fueled by grace. When we can understand what God has given to us, Maybe not even financially. When we can understand all that God's done for us, how do we not, just as a natural response from our hearts, how do we not go, okay, God, how can I bless other people? How can I help other people? You give to in this way because you have been given to in this way. You receive it and then you give it out. Keep reading verse 2. For in a severe test of their affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have what? Overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. In a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy. Because here's the thing. Here's how your mind works, and here's how my mind works. When we hear about somebody who's really generous, there's something in us, and maybe you wouldn't do this, but I bet you would at least be tempted to, and I would be tempted to. When we hear about how somebody's so generous, there's something in our soul that goes, well, yeah, but look how easy it is for them to be generous. Well, sure, if I had their money, I'd be generous. Well, sure, if I had their whatever, I would be generous. And it's almost like Paul says, hang on a second, back up. It wasn't easy for these people to be generous. Why? Because they were in a severe test of their affliction. They were in a severe test of affliction. They were going through it. And even in the midst of going through it, they collected these funds to help people who were in need. See, being generous is a blessing, but generosity during a severe test of affliction is not just a blessing, it's a miracle. Wait, wait, wait. For all that's going on in your life, you're still giving generously? Right. Right. Joy and suffering. This is so big, we don't have time to unpack it. Some of you have been in our church history class during Cap City Academy that meets on Wednesday nights. You've heard some of this, especially in the early days of the New Testament church. You know what the primary thing was that drove and fueled the growth of the New Testament church in the early days? You know what it was? It was joy and affliction. It's such a counterintuitive idea. Wait, wait, wait. You're going to celebrate and you're going to have joy and you're going to be generous and you're suffering the way that you're suffering? Absolutely. This is in your notes. Living with joy in the midst of trouble shows that you possess something Valuable and permanent. Here's a hint. Right then we quit talking about finances, didn't we? This is so much bigger than that. That you and I have been given the opportunity to be called children of God. What what Kyle said at the beginning of this service is 100% true. The sin that you and I don't want to talk about, and I know some of you are sitting here thinking, man, I wish he wouldn't talk about that. Why do we always have to talk about sin? Because it's always with us. And maybe the biggest sin of all is for you and I to believe that it's not with us anymore. Or to pretend that it's not. Or to act like we're better than that. For us, in the midst of our sin, to be given the chance to be called children of God is valuable. We're no longer talking about money. Listen, you can take all my money away. I still have that. And it's permanent. It's valuable and it's permanent. What a great idea. Their extreme poverty, by the way, contextually, came from two sources. The first one, it came from government oppression. 
specifically the Roman Empire. See, they lived in an area where there were gold and silver mines, and there was a lot of trees. And so these gold and silver mines, I mean, that's self-explanatory, right? There's, there's wealth right there. And then trees, they would cut down the trees to build ships, which was a big thing in the Mediterranean region, right? And when the Roman Empire took over, they came in and said, those two resources now belong to us. You don't have anything to do with that. You don't get to reap the benefits of that in any way. And so suddenly there was poverty in these areas where there hadn't been poverty before. The other thing that caused their poverty is exactly what we already talked about. Because of their newfound faith. And in many ways, I think maybe they didn't understand all that was going to happen to them financially and vocationally because of their faith. But maybe they did and they just didn't care. Because this is bigger than that. What does it mean for us to be so sold out in spite of poverty, in spite of being socially ostracized for our faith? See, radical generosity, I want you to hear this. Radical generosity doesn't depend on circumstance. It's bigger than circumstance. It's generosity that in many ways does not make sense at least financially, at least logically, at least humanly. This is the big idea. It's in your notes. Wealth does not produce generosity. Grace and joy produce generosity. It's not wealth that produces generosity. The deepest, most, most heartfelt generosity always comes from grace. It comes from joy. It comes from a response to something. It's not based on, I've got all this extra. How can I give it to other people? It's based on, look at what has been done for me. What are you saying, Tim? There's never a convenient time to be generous. What I love about our elders is that early, early on, before we had ever had a church service, as we sat down and started to think about our budget and how we knew this was what we wanted this to be one of our core values. But do you know it's easy to plan a budget when you don't have any money? <laughs> and when I say this is a church plan, I mean we started at ground zero. There was nothing, right? And I'll never forget sitting in an elders meeting and talking about how we wanted to do it eventually. And Tom Bryan actually was the one that said, Hey, we don't have anything right now. Let's just go ahead and give away a big percentage right now. Because it'll be easier as we grow. And I went, well, that makes sense. Probably one of the other guys would have come up with it eventually. But Tom was the first one to jump out and say, look, it, there's never a convenient time to be generous. You just be generous anyway. You just carve off a percentage from the beginning. And as your income grows, the percentage kind of grows with it. Verse 3. They gave according to their means. These are those, these Macedonian Christians. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. What does it say? Of their own. Yeah, oh, I'm going to stand here till you say it out loud. Accord, right. Not a Honda Accord. Of their own accord. What does that mean? It's voluntary. They gave according to their means and beyond their means of their own accord. And then get this last one. What does it say? Begging us. Have you ever seen somebody beg like, would you let me be generous? Would you let me give? Would you let me help others? Who does that? Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. You know what I like to believe this is? It's them going, hey, just because we don't have any money, don't leave us out of this. Don't exclude us from this opportunity because we can be a part of this. Paul maybe was reluctant to let them be involved, and yet they said, you're not going to keep us out of this. Why? Because radical generosity is proactive. Radical generosity takes Action. Verse 5, last verse. And this, not as we expected. Yeah, you better believe that was unexpected. Who does that? Who lives like this? People have been changed by grace. This, not as we expected, but, oh. They gave themselves first to who? Don't run by it. We were talking... I think it was this week, Tom. We were joking around after uh, the academy. We were talking about church history. 
and about the Crusades. And you, did you guys already do that? You're doing that this week, I think, right? So there was this, I remember hearing a story when I was in church history a thousand years ago, when I was in church history class, uh, I remember hearing a story about how some of the guys who would go and fight for, in the Crusades, they would be baptized. They weren't believers at all, but you got to be baptized into the Christian faith to go and fight, which is a whole mess that you'll unpack on Wednesday night. <laughs> You're going to go on this crusade for the sake of Christianity. So the guys would come to be baptized, and they would be baptized, but they would hold their sword out of the water. You can baptize me, but you're not baptizing my sword because this is what I'm going to kill everybody with. God bless us all, everyone. But I wonder sometimes if we don't hold the checkbook out, right? You can baptize me, but you... you What's for each of us? What is that thing? You can't have this. You don't have this. You know what I love about this? They were all in. They were all in. It wasn't holding part of themselves out of the water. It was a cannonball into the middle of everything. But I, I'm giving myself completely. How do you have radical generosity? Because you've given yourself completely to the Lord. And then by the will of God to them. They gave themselves before they gave their money and they said, God, I am now at your disposal. What would you have me do? Radical generosity encompasses our whole self. So by way of review, and by the way, this is in your notes. By way of review, I think this is in your notes. It's up here. The Macedonian Christians were generous. Here we go. In a time of great affliction... In spite of great poverty, with great joy, to an extent quite beyond their very small means, of their own free will, so much so that they begged to be permitted to take part in ministering to their fellow Christians and placing themselves at Paul's disposal far beyond his expectation. And would you listen to me? That is radical generosity. From people who didn't have a lot. They were still radically generous. So what does this mean for us? And this is the part of the sermon where you may go, oh, this is not something we normally do. Right, but sometimes we have to talk about this. Here's what this means for us. And I know this is in your notes because I put it there on the back page. Our goal as a church from those very early days has been we want to start by giving away 20% of our income. And we really want to do more, much more than that if we're able and these numbers were through one day this week. Uh, Eric Donaldson's our treasurer. He sent me these numbers. Uh, this year to date in 2022, uh, we've given away 25.24% of our income, which is about $65,000, maybe $700. Listen, I'm not trying to get you to give to the church. I'm telling you what you as a church have given away in radical generosities that left the four walls of this building or whatever building we've been meeting in this year. This has gone out. It's gone out. $39,000 of it has gone to local organizations. This is not a complete list, but this is, for example, we've given to Topeka Rescue Mission. We've given to Topeka North Outreach and Operation Backpack, which is a great, great organization. They pack food bags for kids who are, live in food scarcity. We've given to Project to Restore. It's an organization in town that, that helps uh, women who've been trafficked. Um, we've done counseling scholarships. You guys remember we talked about this just a few weeks ago. We've made counseling scholarships available. Those are still available, by the way. And so far this year, that's how much you've given away to help people find emotional and spiritual and mental health and wholeness. Look at me. I didn't do that. You did that. How cool is that? That we have been radically generous. We've given to Doxazo Ministries. We've given to Topeka Young Life. We've given to Lifeline Children's Services. That doesn't include last year's Christmas offering, by the way. This is separate from that, right? And we've given to Mission Church, which is a church many of you know, R.D. Cogswell and Mission Church. They launched, uh, I think, did they launch last year? I feel like they launched last year. And so we've, give, we've given money every month to help them out. And again, this came from our elders. They said, hey, I know we're a church plant, but they're also a church plant, and we want to care about church planting. So until the day that we plant our own churches, we're going to give money across town to help another church plant stay viable and successful. I didn't do that. You did that. 
See, I think we talk a really good game in the kingdom of God about not being in competition. But when it comes down to it, we act like we are in competition. You know what's the best way to be in competition? Write somebody a check. Why don't we just do that? Why don't we just, why don't we just actually believe that we're all on the same team? Then the other part of this, which is what I call SBC stuff, right? The Southern Baptist Convention, warts and all. We've given $26,500 this year so far to that. Here's what that means for those of you who maybe don't understand what it means or you wonder why we're still a part of it. Check this out. Internationally, this year, 3,532 missionaries, that's outside the United States, 3,532 missionaries have been fully funded. Look me in the eye. Fully funded, which means they're on the field doing good, sharing the gospel, and planting churches. They're not coming back to raise support from anybody. They're just out there doing the work. If you, we saw it this year because we had a missionary couple here, and they stood on this stage and said, do not try to give us money. You're already giving us money. We're fully funded. How incredible is that? They shared the gospel with 592,000 people. They saw 177,000 new believers, and they planted 22,700 new churches internationally. Why do we give every month? Because we get to say things like that. Because we get to see things like that. And that's not something we could ever do on our own by ourselves as a church. We get to be a part of that. In North America, since 2010, I loved this statistic. Southern Baptists have planted more than 9,400 churches across North America. And this is so big. Please hear this. You're going to need to learn this because I'm not going to be the only one in the room that understands church planting. You know how I know that? Because we're going to plant churches together. You and I together, we're going to plant churches. And you know what we need to understand? Is that the first four or five years are the most important viability years for a new church plant. It's great for us to plant new churches, but if they don't survive and they don't last, then what good did it do? And yet, how cool is this, that in these North American churches, 80% of SBC churches that have been planted thrive far beyond four years. That's a tipping point in the church planting world. I threw this in there. This is just anecdotal, but I know that it happened. I saw it. You guys remember Hurricane Ian that just came through Florida? I was hearing all about it because that's where my wife and I are from, and we still have friends and family who are there. And it did, it wiped out a lot of things in Florida. And within days, SBC disaster relief was on the ground. They were cooking 100,000 meals a day. It's the largest disaster relief organization in the country. And you know what it's made of? Men and women who, this is so cool. Men and women who, when there's a disaster, they go to their closet and they get their yellow t-shirt out and they put it in their suitcase and they go because there's so many churches like ours who give a portion, who give a portion that the overhead has been funded a long time ago and there's almost no overhead. More of every dollar makes it to the field to help genuine people who are genuinely in need. And all these volunteers just, sh oh, cool. They show up and they wash clothes and they cook food and they wash dishes. How incredible is this? How do we not want to be a part of this? And by the way, if you don't like that plan, do you have a better plan? <laughs> the answer is no. Look at me. And since you don't have a better plan, would it be okay with you if we just do this one? <laughs> I think it's a pretty good plan, by the way. Warts and all. Warts and all. What an incredible opportunity. Here, locally, Christian Challenge. And Kevin can tell you so much more about this. You guys should come up and ask him when the service is over. Ask him more about Christian Challenge, which is this incredible organization, this ministry across the state at, at, at college campuses, universities, that's teaching uh, college students not just to follow Christ, not just to be disciples. Listen but to be disciples that make disciples. How cool is that? How incredible is that? And next week, we're going to talk about the 2022 Christmas offering. We're going to let you know what it's about so you can have a few weeks to pray and plan. Here's a hint. Every single penny that comes in is going to go out. It's not going to benefit you and me. 
And I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about. So here's how we kind of wrap this thing up. Always come back to this verse. You will be enriched in every way. Look at me. You will be enriched in every way so that. We got to stop right there. Why were you made rich? And I know you don't feel rich, but you are rich. You know how I know that? I would love to ask one at a time. Let's take the microphone, pass it around one at a time. Let's ask, what did you decide to have for dinner last night? What did you decide to have for dinner last night? Look at me. You know what the operative word is? You decided. You had choices. How did you get here today? You decided what to wear. We're wealthy in ways that we don't think about. We open the door on a fridge full of food and say, yeah, there's nothing to eat. (laughs) Come on. Lean into this, please. Why were you made rich? Was it so that you can have newer, bigger, better, faster? And there was a red one, but they just came out with the white one, so now I have to have the white one? And I've lost count of what number iPhone we're on now. Is this why? I'm not saying those things are bad or wrong. Listen, look at me. I'm not saying you should feel guilty because you have food in your fridge and things. I'm just asking a question. Why were you made rich? Is it so that we could have more, more, more? Why were they made rich? You will be enriched in every way so that you can be what? Say it again. Maybe in the midst of having enough to eat and enough to wear and having whatever the newest iPhone is, we could just carve off a fairly significant chunk and say, I'm just going to give that away. And if you think we're after your money, give it somewhere else. I just gave you a great list of organizations. Give it to any one of them. But I'm just telling you, every time you give us a dollar, at least 20 cents of it's leaving the building. Hopefully a lot more. Why? Because God's given us so much. God's given us so much. Beyond financial blessings, God's done so much for us. And I just hope that in your soul there's a crater made by the grace of God that never goes away. And it becomes a wellspring of life springing up that I just want to bless other people. I want to be generous. And I know I'm tempted to be petty and I'm tempted to be jealous and I'm tempted to not want other people to succeed or want other people to thrive. But man, I just want to flush all that. And I want to live in the generosity of God. Why? Because I was, I've been enriched in every way so that I can be generous on every occasion and through our generosity will result thanksgiving to God. What an incredible idea that you and I give that chance. That we've been given the opportunity to be generous. So I'm just telling you this. Next week, we're going to have this really fun announcement. And we're going to talk about what's coming for Cap City Church. And at the end, we're going to talk about the Christmas. We're not taking up an offering next week. We're just talking about it. So that you can, for a few weeks, you can think and you can have a discussion and you can pray and you can plan and i got to be honest with you, I want you to know about this before Black Friday gets here. (laughs) It's not to benefit me. I won't get a raise at all from any of it. Why do I want you to know that? Because this is a pretty cool way to spend your money. What an incredible opportunity that we get. But the context for it, please hear this, is not an offering. It's that you're sitting in a church right now that deeply believes in radical generosity. That we want to give so that it hurts. And so that some months we go, well, you know, our life would be easier if we gave less. Right, no, we, we made a pact, we pinky swore, we, you know, we took a blood oath, we put our stick in the fire, we nailed the thing to the cross, right? We did all the things that you're supposed to, like, we're in on this. And we're going to be in on it. We're going to hold each other accountable to this, that we want to be generous. I want to close out with this quote. I love this quote. I came across this this week from Tim Keller. This is so good. 
The early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and they gave practically everybody their money. See, Cap City Church didn't come up with the idea of being radically generous. This is what believers have been doing for centuries. In the midst of affliction, in the midst of suffering, whether they had extra or not, they begged for the opportunity to be able to bless other people. And I think a bunch of you are really on board with this, but spoiler alert, whether you're on board or not, we're just going to keep doing it as a church. Let's pray. Oh, God, you're so good to us. You're so kind to us. This, I mean, this whole conversation centers around your goodness, your kindness, your blessing. God, we really don't deserve the things that you've done for us. We really don't deserve your grace. I mean, I guess that's kind of the point of grace. Yet you give... And you give to us generously, and you keep giving to us generously. God, my prayer, moving forward, is that you would deepen this in our hearts. Before you deepen it in our checkbooks, before you deepen it in our bank account as a church, before you increase how much we give, that you would deepen, deepen, deepen the work that you're doing in our hearts, that it would be driven by a loving response to your grace, by a loving response. We don't want to brag. This is why we don't talk about this a lot. We're not trying to impress anyone. This should be a loving response from our heart to the work that you're doing in us, to the work that you have done in us. (laughs) And, and, And biggest of all, most important of all, to the work you did for us on the cross, And Jesus said, to tell us, die, it's finished. You're in the process of making us more like you, but the truth is, you've finished the work of salvation. And we get the chance to fully participate in that. So make us generous for the right reasons. Give us hearts that unite around something bigger than us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together as we give thanks. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. of the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father.
all my life you have been faithful. Sing it out. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of the goodness of God. Thank you. You guys really need to get to know Kevin. He's a pretty great guy. Um, as uh, Kyle mentioned, he is on staff with the Kansas-Nebraska Convention, which is now known as Church Forward. Church Forward. Where uh, it, it's uh, first of all, Kansas-Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptists is a mouthful, <laughs> just to say that out loud. Uh, but also, we want to be less about what badge we're wearing and more about how we're helping churches yeah. move, move forward. forward. Yeah, so so we, we want to be known by by what we do, not not just who we are. That's right. And we're going to be talking more about that in the weeks to come and in the months to come. Uh, and I know most of you probably don't really care, but for a lot of the existing Baptist churches, this is a big deal because, spoiler alert, Baptists don't like change. <laughs> I've learned that over 30 years. So, by the way, we blame that. We say that older people don't like change. Could I just give you a little hint? Nobody likes change. Uh, Young, old, nobody likes it. So, uh, Keep praying for Eric. Uh, he had his surgery this week, and so he's recovering. He's home from the hospital, but um, it, it's the last couple of days have been rough. So just keep praying for him. Uh, reach out to him if you can, if you want to, text or otherwise. Just let him know you're praying for him. Don't everybody go out of here and text him at 1215, right? <laughs> but just today, tomorrow, sometime, I know it would mean a lot to him. And so uh, if you have any questions, if you want to pray about anything that you heard, um, I'll be hanging around right down front here. I'd be glad to talk with you. Tom's here, one of our elders. I can't see. I think Tim's here. Kyle's somewhere over there. Uh, come find one of us. We'd be glad to talk with you, uh, pray with you. I, I will say this. I learned this years ago. Um, when you preach sermons like this, um, you, you, you want to be really delicate because everybody has their guard up when you come to a church and you talk about money, Right? Uh, but I also learned the other way from somebody years ago. I got a lecture and they actually said, when you talk about something like this, then tell me how that I can give. Because if I, uh, if I supported what you're saying, then I want to be able to give. Uh, so actually in your uh, takeaway card, there's, there's a QR code uh, and that'll take you to the pay giving page. If you want to give to support Cap City Church, you can do that. Whether you give or not, we're just going to keep doing this, okay? Uh, so if you have questions, come and find us. Our benediction for today would be this. This week, may you live a radically generous life, giving without benefit to those who are around you. May your love for others be fueled by the grace that you have received from God himself. As you look for ways to be proactive in blessing them, and may you live with joy, even in the face of difficulty, as you remain anchored in the valuable and permanent love of God for you. Thank you for coming. I hope you have a great week. You are dismissed. <laughs>